we have, and this is the last talk before lunch, Mike Pappas. And I am going to operate the keyboard. Yeah, which gets me out of having to push the buttons and talk at the same time. So, uh, Good afternoon. My name is uh, Mike Pappas. Uh, my call is W9CN. I'm the RF resource coordinator for uh, EOSS. Perfect. Which green one at the bottom. Perfect. Uh, slide. Please. Thank you. Uh, we're a nonprofit. Uh, we've been around for a very long time. Uh, we fly balloons about 10 to 14 a year. Uh, today we're going to fly flight uh, 284. Slide. And uh, we're going to launch from Deer Trail and we're going to land out here in Lincoln County. Except the weather didn't cooperate and we scrub because it's snowing. And that's the fifth scrub for that flight. Weather has not been our friend. We're thinking about a small animal sacrifice to see if we can get the, uh, the gremlins to go away on weather. Uh, we uh, one of the few guys on the planet to have a part uh, 101 FAA waiver. And what that means is we can fly heavies. We provide uh, Denver Tracon with uh, real-time uh, APRS data, and they route air traffic around us. So that took a decade of negotiation, and there's a whole cadre of people with EOSS who all they do is deal with the FAA, because at every opportunity, the FAA would love to chloroform. Okay, they, they don't, you know, it's a, it's a real problem for them, and they keep trying to put the screws to us in terms of when we gotta be on the ground and everything else, we keep pushing back, uh, because for us, uh, being able to fly heavies is really important. Most of our clients uh, need us to do that. And heavies are stuff that have a neck load of about 30 pounds. So that's a pretty good size payload for us. And we fly that pretty much regularly. We're in the 26 to 28 pound payload class. Uh, everybody knows there was an eclipse on the 21st of 2017. Uh, two years in front of that, NASA wanted us to fly a couple of balloons for them. Now, the trick here was we're not looking at the eclipse. The payloads are looking down. What NASA wants to find out is if clouds form during the eclipse. So instead of a really balloons looking up, we were looking down. Uh, that was a coordinated effort uh, with uh, Sue Boulder. They used a bunch of Doppler weather trucks they lined up on a north-south road. They were scanning into the area that we were photographing at the same time. We had a target of being at 86,000 feet at totality in a certain window. For us, that's a walk in the park. We kind of do that all the time. So the problem became comms. So launch site is Camp Guernsey uh, Army Airfield. Predicted landing area is somewhere in this range. That's Torrington, Wyoming up here is a wide spot in the road called Harrison, Nebraska. And we expected our landing area to be in this area. Now, <clears throat> there are no comms there, none. Four miles outside of Torrington, there's no cell service. The Sheriff's Department, Goshen County Sheriff's Department, does not have VHF coverage anywhere north of this area. So for us, how are we going to get comms? Because, for, right, ham radio, right? And in the, and in the, you know, the let's do it ham radio theorem, we woke up one morning and said, what we really need to do is build a three-site UHF EMR system and link it with micro. And that's exactly what we did. So uh, back up one for a second. So we figured that we would need some sort of site here in this landing area, someplace high, that would get us enough coverage so that our track and recovery teams could have comp. And we also needed uh, comms from the launch site because we have to coordinate with launch during the whole track and recovery because they're doing all these predictions as to where they think this is going to come down. And we're going to get our forces of track and recovery people of about, I think we had 10 of us, out there. And our goal with track and recovery is I want to be standing by some farmer's cornfield looking up and going, it's coming down right there. 
That's our goal. We want to be standing by the side of the road. Now, some other things that are going on here. The population of Wyoming is doubling for the eclipse. Doubling. Right? There's very little cell service. The sheriff's department's radios don't work. And we've got 600,000 people coming up from Colorado who are all probably doing bong hits. Right? Yeah, legally. Yo, yo dude, you're harsh in my mellow. So we, we kind of, you know, we, we planned uh, for the worst. And we did a test flight two years in advance just to see what we were up against. So we launched out of here and we all hung out around here and we found out we didn't have any comms and the cell service didn't work. And uh, we recovered it and we learned a lot. It's all about learning. So comms are going to be done on UHF. Now, why is that? Well, for a couple of reasons. First off, all of our beacons, DF, everything else are all done on two meters. And you can't use VHF while you're trying to sniff out very small signals from 95,000 feet up. It just doesn't work. Uh, the other thing is that with UHF, we have the ability to rent gear, which you don't have as much of an option with VHF. And then there's other issues like size of antennas and all other stuff. But the biggest one is that if you use VHF while you're trying to listen to those packets from 95,000 feet up, you tend to desense that stuff and you miss packets. And because our software that our guys built for us have to look at every packet going up to determine a prediction on every packet coming down, and that does that in my vehicle as I'm driving. Uh, if every time I miss a packet, uh, my uh, uncertainty of where I land becomes geometrically bigger. So typically, we like our predictions to come up within a mile or so if we actually put it on the ground. If you blow a bunch of packets, you can be 10 miles out. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, perfect. So uh, the, the solution to us was DMR, right? Digital uh, Mobile Radio, uh, AKA Turbo. Um, we said, no, this will be easy. We'll just build a three-site system. We'll link it with microwave. We'll do uh, roaming lists in all the radios so the guys can drive around. It was like P25 uh, public safety radio. Push the transmit button, get the go tone. System figures out which site you're going to use, and away you go. We can rent gear economically. We had some experience with it. Uh, from a spectral efficiency standpoint, uh, we had two time slots on one frequency. So the evil thought process was we use the second time slot as backhaul to the sheriff's department because we had a ham who was doing dispatch that day. So if you stumbled across some sort of auto wreck or other problem where you were without cell service and the sheriff's department called in everybody that day but still was stretched pretty thin over the whole giant area, uh, we thought that was a really good plan B. So the first thing we had to do is get frequency. So we started early and we coordinated frequencies. Uh, the key here was uh, we wanted uh, five pairs of uh, ESC <clears throat> narrowband uh, digital pairs, and we needed a minimum of 100 kilohertz spacing between those pairs. Now, the reason we wanted that was so if you were in a situation where the guy in the back is roamed into one site, and I'm roamed into a different site that we didn't have some sort of wonky descents. Now, because it's TDMA and it's all keyed off the repeater, i.e. the repeater tells the radio when to transmit, odds of you having a problem there of descents are pretty remote, except for the fact that if you were roamed into the main site and you, the other person was roamed into, for example, Torrington, there's a 250 millisecond transit delay on the microwave line. So there's a potential for it. So, you know, in typical ham radio fashion, at least our end of the world, we way over designed this thing. And uh, that's why we wanted 100 kilohertz spacings. And those are our frequency. Uh, uh, you can see the ones in bold are the ones that we got. We identified them with where we were going to build these systems. So Wheatland, Clay Ranch, uh, K7STM John Patrick was a site that we looked at and actually didn't build because the system worked so well. So we did it with three instead of four. We always have a spare, always a spare. And then Torrington. 
So this is uh, the main, this is ground zero for the system. This is uh, the WA7SNU uh, repeater site located outside of uh, Wheatland. Uh, they're at about 5,300 feet of elevation. That's a 200 foot, well, sorry, 190 foot stick. And uh, the site's owned by a, a lovely uh, gal who's a ham. And uh, she let us use the site gratis. Very nice of her. Of course, we left that site in a lot better shape than we got there. We swept it. We took all our garbage out. We put a couple of bolts and some antennas that were missing. We have three uh, Nate certified uh, tower climbers uh, as part of EOSS. So we did all of our own tower work. And uh, that's Stephen Muir, and he's about to hang a microwave panel that's going to talk to uh, Gene Layard's ranch. Now, when we got our uh, DMR system up and running here, uh, we were on the top of that tower, and um, we got coverage on uh, Interstate I-25 at mile marker 14, and Wheatland is at uh, mile marker 78. So we had 64 miles coverage off that site, and that's pretty good. And then uh, Lay Ranch. So we needed a place north of Torrington that looked into Nebraska. And um, the dispatcher for the Sheriff's Department, who'd been dispatching for 20 years, knew everybody. And he goes, I know just the guy you need to call. And I'll warm him up. So you call him, right? So I call this guy. Name is Gene Lay. He's got 9,000 acres, does cattle, does purebred horses for something, barrel racing, or I don't know quite understand, right? Nicest guy on the planet. I go out there and meet with him. I said, well, Gene, how long have you been here? Well, we've been here since 1849. Woof. And um, he has this site up on this giant butte. Uh, he's got a VHF uh, system because there's no cell service out there. So all the ranch stuff is on VHF commercial. And uh, we built a site up there. And uh, Gene was nice enough to let us use it. Of course, we cleaned up a couple of problems with his VHF system while we are up there because we want to leave the place in better shape than when we got there. Uh, the last thing I ever want to hear is, well, we don't want those guys ever back again because they left a mess or, you know, were a problem. Anyway, um, we put an SLR 5700 in there uh, with a cell wave uh, six-cavity duplexer. Uh, this is our favorite antenna these days, which is a Telwave uh, NT450. D3. Now, what's cool about this antenna is I can change the pattern of it in the field, right? Because using Omnis kind of isn't all that really great of an idea. And so that's set for hard cardioid, and it's pointed out towards Nebraska. And in hard cardioid, it gives me 6 dBd of gain. Now, I come from a broadcast background, so all I'm really caring about is ERP, right? How much ERP am I generating, right? So I got 50 watts, I got a dB of loss in the, in the feed line, and I got 6 dB on the antenna. You know, it's 180 watts. I keep forgetting about the 6 dB also uh, impacts you receive. You get it both ways, which is fun. Microwave link is uh, 38 miles to uh, Wheatland. We used a Cambium network uh, PTP 650. Uh, we put this in for the test flight, and uh, then Gene uh, bought a as he referred to it as the outhouse. And uh, we operated out of the outhouse for the test flight. We put the repeater uh, in a cardboard box and wrapped it in a 60 gallon garbage can uh, liner. So we kind of put the amateur really into amateur radio for the test flight. But for the real thing, uh, we got serious about it. All these sites, we put uh, Minuteman uh, uninterruptible uh, double conversion UPSs in with extra battery packs because we didn't know if there was going to be some sort of wonky power fluctuation and put us off the air. So we had about a three and a half hour run time on the UPSs and all sites were UPS. Oh, nice picture of storm weather. It uh, hailed on us about 15 minutes after I took that image from the top of the butte. Um, uh, there's the microwave pass study from Wheatland to Ray Lay Ranch, approximately 350 feet down from Wheatland, our Wheatland site, to Lay. And that's how you get down from, uh, from Lay Ranch. That's a road. Yes. And we made that trek six times. 
and uh, we only broke one truck. Yeah, that was, uh, uh, what you don't see is uh, off the side here is about a 100 foot drop. And uh, it's pretty narrow and uh, it, you just don't want to be looking down while you're taking that drive. Block diagram of the system. So uh, microwave links, we had to uh, synchronize the microwave links using PTP. And the reason we did that is so that the two microwave systems didn't desense each other. So our microwave guru set all that up. And the timing on this system has to be set for the longest path, which is 38 miles down to uh, Gene Lay's ranch. The shorter path is 27 miles to uh, Torrington. And, uh, but it all has to be timed for the longest link, which like 400 some milliseconds. You can do the math. It's 38 miles times two times the speed of light times you, all you math wizards, you got that down. I can't do it. All right. Um, so this is a coverage study that we did showing the three sites. So Cherry Knoll, Torrington, Lay Ranch. Everything that's in blue is 45 microvolts a meter or greater. Okay. I don't care about anything above that because at 45 microvolts a meter, it's digital. I'm going to be a full quiet. There's no other way it's going to work. And this was, we were way conservative on this uh, coverage study, which is kind of the way we really wanted to do it. And it was surprising how much extra coverage that we got out of the system. But just doing uh, the coverage study, we covered 7,000 square miles of Wyoming and Nebraska system. And in Harrison here, which is outside of the coverage, you could stand in downtown Harrison, which is a wide spot on the road, and you could key it up with a 7550 five watt radio and with full, full work. In fact, it was funny because the sheriff was sitting out there trying to get into dispatch with this 110 watt VHF P25 radio, and it didn't work. And I handed him our handheld and said, Dispatch is on the time slot, here you go. And he's like, this will never work. And it keyed right up and it worked. <laughs> uh, we pre-built everything and tested it relentlessly before it went out in the field. Uh, my wife wasn't too thrilled about using the kitchen table, but uh, there's an 8300 with a six cavity uh, duplexer and my Rodian Shores vector network analyzer getting tuned up. We also have a HP 8920A which I found a guy in upstate New York who still works on those, and uh, that's cool. Uh, you know, here's uh, pre-tuning pre duplexers. Uh, one of the things we learned was do not trust any duplexer that shows up from somebody tuned already. We found those typically were a mess, and uh, we tended to want to get every ounce of performance out of the system, so we were pretty re relentless on tuning duplexers. You know, this one's at 91 dB, a notch, and that's not quite enough for us. I typically want to be about 98. So this is before we got started with it. And we test and log everything. So uh, for us, even though we're running digital, we had no way to actually test digital sensitivity. Right? I don't have a DMR capable test set. Um, Rodian Shores has a very nice one. It's 35,000 um, bucks. What we did was we tested them in analog mode. Right, figuring if it's really good in analog, it's probably going to be okay in digital. Our goal here was 120 dB uh, to uh, 12 dB synad in analog. That was our minimum. So if we didn't get that, we were trying to figure out why. And you can see we're at 121, 120, 121. We also uh, calculated the uh, TX uh, loss through the duplexers to see how much we're actually losing there. And that was based on measuring the input power into the duplexer and the output power and converting it all to DBM, which I have a calculator to do, and then put up with the loss. So you can see we're at 1 dB, 1.27, and 0.95. We could not get reliable coverage into the dispatch center without a site in Torrington. So we thought we had a site all organized at the uh, airport. Problem was, microwave shot just didn't work. So our guy on the ground called the mayor of Torrington at 9 p.m. on Friday night and said, we need to use the water tower. And the mayor said, sure, we'll be out there at 7.45 in the morning. And they were on Saturday. 
And so we installed that. Uh, yeah, hit it again, please. So there's the um, microwave panel. Uh, we bought a uh, outdoor enclosure for the whole system. We mounted it all up. Away we went. Uh, there's a uh, an Omni uh, Procom uh, 6 dB, yeah, 6 dB antenna there, and that allowed us to uh, operate in uh, uh, the dispatch center without any issues. That for us was kind of an important plant B. Eclipse Day, uh, you know, we're pretty well ready to go. Everything's happening. Uh, we drive tested the system on Saturday with four groups of volunteers who spent the whole day driving around Wyoming where we thought this thing was going to land and <clears throat> to make sure that the system worked. Now, we had a very high confidence level it was going to work because we'd been driving it for a week before. But what we wanted to do is get everyone's confidence built up that all they had to do is get in the car. We rented 10 XPR 4550s, programmed them up all ahead of time. They all had roam lists, all tested, all installed vehicles ready to go, right? Turn the power on, set the volume. All you had to do was push the button. Pinging was set up for every 30 seconds, which is uh, at 60 miles an hour, it's a half a mile. Worked perfectly. Off we went. So this is kind of what it looked like on Eclipse Day, right? There's all these people doing all kinds of really stupid stuff like parking cars with hot catalytic converters on tall grass by the side of the road. Folks were wandering down the middle of highway, right? Just completely oblivious to the fact that there are vehicles going down the road. And of course, we uh, had to make new friends in Torrington with the police department. Uh, that was kind of a funny shot. Um, you got to have some humor here. So the first one lands uh, 43 miles downrange, uh, two hours and 17 minute flight time, uh, 19 miles south southwest of Harrison. It was long by about 10 miles, 15 miles. Thank you. Um, the second one went way long, and it was 62 miles downrange, two hour 49 minutes, way out, way beyond what we thought our coverage pattern was for the system. It all worked. Um, what did we learn? Start early, uh, figure out what you're going to do for frequencies, get that organized. It's going to take a lot longer. Uh, explain what you need, why you need it, for how long you're going to need it for. Uh, enlo enlist local boots on the ground. Uh, really important. To, our dispatch guy, who is a ham, was just instrumental in getting us organized for everything from Gene Lay's site to we had a backup plan. And one of the ranchers had 6,000 gallons of unleaded fuel that he was willing to let us use if they ran out of gas in Wyoming. Remember, we got, we doubled the population of Wyoming for this event. And I was concerned that we couldn't get fuel. And I was concerned that we couldn't get food and that there were some other issues there that might go on. Uh, understand the use case and system users' capabilities. Try to get everybody's buy-in. Simplify user experience. Uh, must be KISS, um, manage expectations, yeah, go on. Uh, run conservative studies, um, I got through that. So we're looking for our next challenge for 2024. If you've got a comms problem and need some guys uh, that can help fix it, uh, come and see us. Thank you very much. Was that quick enough? That's it. We have uh, one question. No? All right. Cool. Thank